Hey everybody, my next guest is one of the top impressionists in the country. He's a Philadelphia native and one of the busiest, highly polished, multifaceted entertainers in the business and was even the winner of the 2018 Sybil Award for Best Impersonator at the Sunburst Convention of Professional Celebrity Impersonators. Here he is, folks, the one and only John Monforto, a.k.a. Rocky Balboa. What's up, John? How you doing, buddy? Oh, well, you know, I figured I'd... Since you had that great introduction, I gotta at least do an impersonation of somebody, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, the reason I did this is because uh, I am the official Rocky Balboa impersonator for the city of Philadelphia. So I figured why not, you know? <laughs> that's huge to be the official um you know anything <laughs> yeah yeah but to carry the torch for the the uh you know such an iconic character as Sylvester Stallone and I did have um Mike Kunda on a while ago and and cool. he yeah he gives you a lot of credit for starting this whole thing and wow. uh he, he gave you high praise so yeah and uh yeah I mean you know what I I remember Mike um Years ago, when Mike was first starting out, I was doing Rocky, and he called me, and he said, he said, do you have any advice? He said, I want to get not only in the business, he said, but I want to, I actually want to do Rocky, like you're doing. And, you know, I think the average guy who would feel like, hey, you're invading my territory, but uh, I, look, whatever info I gave him, I, obviously it helped because he's doing okay. He was, he's actually endorsed by Stallone, too, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's pretty cool, and 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 that was you know it says a lot for you guys, you know Philadelphia guys, you know brotherly love and all that stuff. But for you to kind of be able to share the spotlight as the you know the number one Rocky guy to say, hey, you know what, I got room for you too, pal. I think yeah, that's you know what, that's like Elvis. That's another thing I do. There's a million Elvis impersonators out there. You know what? There's plenty of work done. Right, plenty of work. So no worries. <laughs> You know, because I, I often wondered in because it's like that in a lot of other industries, you know, is is there, you know, kind of the the um, that competitive edge, you know, when it's because, you know, with impersonations in general, you know, um, one guy, you know, like you said, a lot of people do Elvis, people doing Stallone, people doing, you know, um, Sinatra. It, um, is is there this, you know, camaraderie amongst all of you? in the business or is it very competitive? Well, that's a very interesting question. And I'm going to ask, obviously I'm going to answer it as honestly as I can. When we're together, there's a camaraderie. And I like to believe that the camaraderie exists when we're not together, but I, I can't say a hundred percent that I believe it exists. Cause I know that there are some people who are just, you know, cutthroat this industry itself, Don, is a nasty industry. Everybody, you know, everybody needs money. Everybody's going to do what they care. Is going to undercut you, or they're going to say something that's a little off color about you. And I hate to say that because I believe in my fellow man. I really do. I want to believe that you're as honest as as I am, and you know all that stuff. A lot of people say, "Hey, you're washed out," but you know what I mean. Nobody does that anymore. And I'm sorry, that's the way I was raised. I still believe that people are like that, you know. But um, I know in my industry, there's there's a lot of people that do what I do. But you got different. Let's take Mike Kunda for instance. Now, I'm my Rocky is I can go into a room with millionaires or bombs or anything like that. And I can have a conversation. I can do stand-up comedy as Rocky because I do it in my show. Right, that's awesome. A couple of my shows. But Mike Kunda has a whole different aspect of the Rocky industry. He And he's smart too, man. He, he takes a tour. He takes people on a tour of the city, of the places where the Rocky movie was filmed. Now, that's brilliant. You know, so he's not stepping on my toes at all, and I don't think I'm stepping on his. But it ain't about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. 
how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Right, yeah, because you guys, are, you, you're both embracing Rocky Balboa, but you're doing it in different mediums. You're, yeah. you're doing it more on the stage and as a one-man show and, and exactly. incorporating it into, into your act where exactly. he's doing it kind of like, you know, uh, as a tour guide and, and mm -hmm. all these types of things. And, and um, yeah, so yeah. I see what you're saying. So there is a lot of room, you know, for everybody. There, I believe there is. You know what? And if you really want to do something and you have the ability to do that something, you're going to make it work for yourself no matter what you have to do. Right, so, yeah. And he did. He had the drive. He made it work. So good for him. Would you get upset? Like, what's the thoughts of, of a guy who's not from Philly doing Rocky? Because both you and Mike are like Philly yeah. guys, so it's like in your blood. Well, there's another, there are two other guys I know. Um, one of them is from Texas. His name is uh, Jade. I can't remember his last name, but I don't have, look. Right. <laughs> I don't want to say I don't care. I do care, but what can I do about it? You know, if you're doing a, if you have a corporate client that is having a big meeting in Philadelphia, a multi-day meeting, and you have a trade booth, and they want to bring in Rocky, and they're from Texas, and they bring in Jade, Good for him. Right, right. Matter yeah. of fact, Jade, Jade is so cool that we were actually doing the same trade show at the Philadelphia Convention Center. He's at one end, I'm at the other. He found out I was there. He came to get me and brought me over to his booth. And we had <laughs> pictures with two Stallones there. It was really cool. So That's awesome. Keep punching. Keep moving forward. It'll be a real knockout. Absolutely. Yeah, he's like me. He doesn't. I don't say he doesn't care, but you know what? You gotta, you gotta play along. Look, I'm not really Rocky. I know that, <laughs> and I'm a lucky man to be doing what I'm doing. So I'll share that luck, and I'll share that whatever I gotta do. It's fine with me. Yeah, I think I think it's super cool. And uh, was there ever a time when like, is there? And I I don't know if there is or not. I think there should be. But is there any kind of Rocky conventions itself where, you know, uh, Rocky enthusiasts can all get together and, uh, you know, kind of like like a Comic-Con type of thing? There, you know, there might be. Honestly, I don't know. I've never heard of one. They have an annual Rocky run here in Philadelphia. Thousands of runners from across the country came to the art museum this morning for one reason, to run like Rocky. I mean, I'm the only Rocky that's there because I'm hired by the city to come out, you know, and greet, meet and greet with the people. And um, but I don't know. That would be cool if there was, though. I'd go. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'd be there. You know? I would go there. You know what I mean? <laughs> I bring raw eggs for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Like uh, how detailed you are. You even got the the ball. They bounced with yeah, you. you and, the ball, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm trying to work. Trying to work my right hand. As good as my left hand, you know. <laughs> How long have you went, like? So, you must have been one of the first ones, kind of embracing the Rocky impressions and stuff like that. Like, how long have you been on the scene doing these, doing this stuff? And like, you know, how did you? How did you? What made you decide to take on the the Rocky persona? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I was living in Manhattan at the time. I was actually called by the the casting director for Rocky One. To be his stand-in. Wow. The first question she asked me, she said, How tall are you? And I was too tall. And right. I didn't know that I didn't know that he was shorter than my height at the time. But when you're doing a stand-in, you have to be the same height because they set the cameras and lights on you. Yeah, right. The lights and everything. Out, and you know, that screws them up. But uh, so that was in what 70, what year did it come out? 76? Whatever. Right. The, I didn't even think about it at then because the movie had to have come out for me to hear the voice and think that I could do it. So I'd say later that year after it came out, I got a phone call. Somebody asked me if I could do Rocky and right there when I was, yo, I don't, yeah, I guess I can. So that's how it started, Don. I never really, I didn't aspire to be a Rocky impersonator. It's just one of those things that happened and 
as it happened, I'd accept the job here, you know, then you got to start your research and your homework. You know, what did he wear? How does he walk? You know, what's he doing? His lip, what he does. You know, when I do the right. rock, I don't know if you can see it, but every time I do it, my eye closes. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> that one, it's natural. It happens all the time. So. But um, I think I answered your question. I, I didn't really aspire to do it. It just kind of happened. And it I built on that on that happening. And then I'd get another call. Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? And mainly it was photo ops at first. And then after that, I started to develop a little bit of the characterization. I'm thinking, you know what? I got to do more than just stand there and take pictures. Right. So, right. you know, I have a I have a pretty good uh, grasp of like comedy and things like that. And I just kind of incorporated my own personality with a little bit of comedy into the Rocky character. I'm driving this guy up to the mountains, dude. And there's a sign and it says, careful of falling, Rock. How the hell did they know I was gonna be there? Did they call you? That's awesome. And yeah, when Rocky first came out, if, like you said, if, I think it must have been 76 or around that time period. I was, I was a little kid, but that was such a phenomenon, that movie. That movie changed everything. Like a lot of those movies in the 70s did, but but Rocky in particular and, and that kind of story, that kind of underdog storytelling underdog. and yeah. all that, you, you know, so I think it just kind of took the world by storm and, and um, it, it I could see being a Philly person getting wrapped up in that and, and being like, yes, this is, this guy is, you know, this is it. This is who I am. This is who I identify. Like everybody feels yeah. a little bit of Rocky. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's labeled as Philadelphia's native son. Right. Uh, yeah. You think about what he's done for the city. Look, Philadelphia has always been a, you know, a major city in the United States. But when that movie came out, the entire movie, basically the exteriors were filmed in Philadelphia. And you got to see the city. And yeah. not only you felt the flavor of the city. He's running through the Italian market. Do you know how like beautiful the Italian market is? Forget the movie. Right, right. Come to Philly. Go to the Italian market. You got on the streets. You got uh, selling their wares and their goods. And you're bickering and you're bartering. And it's like something out of a out of a movie. Oh, did I just say that? So, you know. <laughs> Uh, he really brought Philly into the light, big time. He definitely did, and, and made it like a, a a tourist attraction. I mean, how many people run those stairs in the well, library? <laughs> now there's another. There's another story. Uh, you know this. You know there's a big statue of Rocky. Yeah. After the movie came out, he really you know built up the city. They, someone made a statue. I wish I knew the guy's name. I don't, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful. I think it's bronze statue of Rocky with his arms up like this. Yeah, it's great. They put it at the top of the art museum steps. Now, that is a fine art museum. My understanding of the story, you probably know this. I guess Mike must have told it. No, Maybe, I, I don't know. this is this is new, new one. Yeah. Um the curator of the museum at the time was getting a little bit upset because people were coming from all over the world to the front of his building, running up his steps and raising their arms and jumping around, but they wouldn't come inside to see the fine art. <laughs> so he's thinking, man, all these missed opportunities. So I don't know what prompted them. They took the statue down. They took it away and they put it somewhere else. I think they put it at Veterans Stadium for a while. Wow. And when Vet Stadium was demolished, they put it away. They put it in, a, I don't know where. They put it in the vault somewhere. And the next thing you know, they take it out. But now it's at the bottom of the steps of the art museum on the right-hand side. And at the top, where it used to stand, they have a bronze plaque that says Rocky, an imprint of size 11 Converse, which just so happened to be my size. <laughs> uh, and that's the story behind the that whole statue thing being moved back and forth. 
Wow. It, it, and I, I can understand the, uh, you know, the museum's frustration with that because, you yeah. know, if you want high art and, and you, you know, and, and um, you know, Rocky's like the every man story and it's yeah. the every, every man type people probably coming there to see, take pictures and want to just run the steps because it's iconic. I've ran the steps. I was in, I, I went to Philly a few times. Love the great city, by the way. I love that city. So much history there. Yeah, you know Benjamin Franklin and all that stuff, and then you got the Rocky stuff, and and uh, we we went through um, most of the places, and and I did get to run the stairs and saw the statue, and and I stood in the sneakers with, with the, the feet print and took my picture. <laughs> we did all the tourist stuff, but yeah. um, but yeah, it was it was super cool, and uh, yeah, and, and Rocky is is one of those characters, and that movie, uh has never like it's still as great today when you watch that the first one uh it's as great today as it was you know the when it first came out so it stood the test of time you know you know what's real interesting about the whole you, you you've got the movie rocky about the underdog making it big i don't know if everybody knows the true story of how sylvester stallone had the movie made that in itself should be a movie because he wrote the script, the screenplay, and he was real good friends with Henry Winkler because they, they starred in, I think it was not the Lords of Flatbush. Maybe it, it was the Lords it of was Flatbush. It was the Lords of Flatbush. Yeah. yeah, they were both in that together. And uh, a Winkler's, I don't know, relative was a producer. So Henry said, give me this, give me this thing. I'll take it. I'll let them look at it. Well, he took them. They then looked at it. They loved it. They bought it. But they didn't want to put Stallone in it. They wanted somebody else. So Stallone, I don't know how he did it. He went to them. He got it back. Wow. He got, That's rare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he went back to them three times before they agreed to let him play that role. So... I'm sorry, that's an underdog story right there. And then all of a sudden, bang, it hits and it becomes a smash. That's he's a smart guy, man. Look what he's doing. He's got a huge presence online on like yeah. Facebook. Yeah. He now has a store at the base of the art museum steps, a Rocky shop. Wow. He's got that TV show. What's that? Um, another show where he plays a oh, like uh, the mafia thing. Bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget the name of it. Something in Oak Tulsa. Yes, Tulsa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's uh he really knows what he's doing. Yeah, and and um yeah, and like you said, that story uh, that should be a movie because yeah. uh because they you know they made a movie about the making of uh Francis Ford Coppola, you know, the godfather, they the, that right. whole story. I think this is just as good as that, like the kind of how it was made. And the fact that, like you said, it is an underdog story because Stallone, he was still a relatively unknown, just rising star actor at the time, you know, just kind of making, you know, bit parts here and there. Uh, and then he, but he held out and he held out, you know, guy who needed the money at the time and he held out yeah. because he wanted to star in it. And that ultimately changed his life. Like if he had just sold it, he probably would have been okay. Maybe got, got a new car or something. <laughs> but yeah. we, you, he sold his dog. He was so hard up for money. He sold Butkus. Yeah. <laughs> he brought him back after the movie was out. Right. But he sold his dog. Yeah. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you mentioned The Godfather. That's another character I do. I have a whole show with The Godfather. Uh, I, have a, I do a lot of different things. I'm so glad I do because I don't want to say I get tired quickly, but it's a big selling point for me, which is really what keeps me busy. Luigi. Luigi, I'm very, very sorry to hear about your brother, Mario. Passing away tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. It's a terrible thing because he was a good boy. What I love that you do is that you do a lot of these iconic personalities, whether it's like, you know, John Wayne, Jerry Lewis, Frank Sinatra, right. Elvis, uh, obviously uh, Rocky. Um, and I think it's what's important about it is is you're kind of keeping the attention on on these um, iconic characters. So they're not forgotten almost in a way. 
not that like some some of these are you know stand that you know, like they're bigger than life like you know Frank or an Elvis but yeah. but like the the John Waynes and the Jerry Lewises you, you feel like these generations it's it's starting to slip through the cracks of TikTok and whatever they're into and they'll you know these are just names they know they don't really they're not in tune with the characters so how important for you uh, is it to kind of when you're doing the your shows to like instill this like hey look you know these are i'm doing iconic characters here that pave the way for for everything well it's it's interesting i i guess the only thing i can say is that i know who my target audience is and no matter where i perform yeah i'm going to have some young people and uh, after each show i like to stand by the exit door and i I thank the people for coming and if they want to photograph, blah, blah, blah. And every once in a while, I get a young person say, who was that? Who was that guy that you did? And it, it was Alfred Hitchcock. Good evening. And welcome to the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and they, the adults, or I'm sorry, the seniors hear the music. They know right off the bat who it is. But, uh, I would love to think that I am getting across the classic characters that I'm doing to Gen X people or, you know, whatever the age group is that loses it or lost it. You know, you talk about the Beatles now. They don't even know who. Well, who were the Beatles? And Or they couldn't name them. You, you know, they could, yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff like that is is crazy. Like, it's just weird how it's it's slipping through, and I think it's because there's there's so much out there, like you know, um, for them to get distracted by or just keep moving forward, or they just the phones and and all that. But I, I think that if they did catch your show or or see one of your videos, if it's you know goes viral, that they could say, "Who is this guy? He, like, who's John Wayne or whatever?" And then they could maybe investigate it and kind of you you could be the spark that leads to to them to uh, go down that rabbit hole, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's look, we grew up with it, so it was like thrown at us, and you know, we didn't have cell phones or the technology that we have today. So all you had was a little box in front of you. And I remember as a kid, I was lucky if we got three, six, and ten. Right, <laughs> exactly. And then UHF, UHF came in. It was like, oh my gosh. 17, 29, 48. And now you can, you're all over the world. Yeah. There's nothing. You can get anything you want at fingertips. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, but it's... you know, you had those, that that's all we had. We had those characters to watch on TV. So we look, whether they were good or bad, man, we loved them. I know I did. Right. Yeah, for sure. I had to go get my Steve Canyon helmet as a little kid. You, I don't even know if you know Steve Canyon, but. Steve Canyon was a was a cartoon at first, and they made it. They made a little cartoon TV show out of it, and he had this helmet with the visor that came. Down. I've seen Steve Canyon. Yeah, yeah, I know you're talking about. Right up, and like, wow, that was the big deal for Christmas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when um, when we were kids, or when I was kids, you know, um, the first person I saw that really did impressions. Was Rich Little? Oh, I'd like to take a crack at it. No, 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 no. I, I, I think I should do it. You see, I, I had my heart set on doing this when I arrived here. Your time's up. <laughs> I'm gonna make the announcement. You see, for nothing. Holy Dave Clark fight, Batman! Why don't you do it, Batman? Never mind that, Robin. Just keep dead. <laughs> And I think Rich Little uh, is like the, the godfather of this or the king of of impressions. I think he kind of – people were doing impressions, obviously, f as long as stand-up's been around, but, you know, vaudeville and all that. But I think what Rich Little did was he made it to it the way we do it today. He dressed up like the characters. He did the body language and all the, those sorts of things. Um, who inspired you, like uh, – was it guys like Rich Little or? Yes, uh... yes it was Rich Little, Fred Travelina. Yeah. Um, it was uh, the guy who played the Riddler on Batman, Frank Gorshin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, without me, you are nothing. You hear that? 
You give me away, I promise you. The bat phone, the bat orang, the bat mobile, the bat cave, everything bat goes. Holy bat rupsy! I actually met Frank Gorshin. I had lunch with Frank Gorshin in, out in Las Vegas, and uh, I was just, my jaw was on the table, you know, and I, I was like, you know, I, I was like a total blithering idiot because <laughs> he was a childhood, uh, what do you call it? What's the one word I'm looking for? I was just a huge fan of his. Yeah, come on, he's on television. He's so I would, I would watch him. I would watch these other guys, and uh, lock myself in my room for hours with a, you know, a little cassette recorder or something like that, and just go off and just do stuff. And that's where how I started getting into the voices and the characterizations, and I did want to make a. Um, a comment about when you introduced me, you said impressionist, I believe. I, yeah, might there, have. There are differences between an impressionist, an impersonator, and one who pays tribute. And I do all three of those things. So when I say I do around 30 characters, that means all of those words are included in there. I'll pay tribute to Neil Diamond and Tony Bennett, and Frank Sinatra, and Engelbert Humperdinck. Doesn't mean I sound like them. It means I'm doing their music. I'm doing their arrangements. I'm right. doing whatever, you know, he, Tony Bennett would cross his arms like this, and he'd, he'd be smiling, he'd be looking, he'd always, I'll do all, all that kind of stuff. But it's not an impersonation like my Elvis, or my Rocky, or my Godfather. Or, you know, another dozen other characters. And so I just wanted to let your audience know that there's a big difference there, you know. And an impression is is something else where you can just, you don't even have to talk. You can just stand there and do a movement or something like that. Right, or say right. say a word and people are like, oh, my gosh, I know who that is. Right. You know, that kind of thing. So that's all I wanted to say about that's that. That's interesting that you say like there is a difference between those three. And yeah. and, and I understand what you mean by by like, you know, uh the tribute is is you're paying an homage to, to them, right. you know, and, and it's not a you know an impersonation and, and yeah, so I think that's I think that's I never thought of it that way, you know. Yeah, I mean when I do let's say I'll do a rat pack show or Sinatra show. When I'm doing Sinatra, look, he's hard to sound like. Yeah. He really is. He has a very, very distinct voice. But I'll give you the true essence of Sinatra with not only my singing voice, but with my mannerisms, with the way I talk to the people. I'm using Frank's jargon. He say, hey, yo, you want good looking broad. You're a real barn burner. You know, he used words like that. Right, right, yeah. Oh, you know, and that's when you pay tribute to someone. That's what that's all about. I'll dress like him. All songs I'm singing, I'm going to sing like him. That kind of thing. From the waist up, darling. Because I still love you so. What you know? Even though you hurt me like nobody else. And I and I do want to say too, I was you know watching a bunch of your stuff, and you got to you could really sing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, like when when you get into the Frank mode or Elvis, um, yeah. you know you, you're really like, uh, is, is that something that you always wanted to pursue was the singing as well, or did that just come with the with the act? Well, I'm a I'm a singer first. I am a trained singer. My my teachers were a husband and wife couple out of Cherry Hill, New Jersey who were graduates of Juilliard School of Music. So when I was taught, I was taught by people who knew opera. Wow, yeah. So I was taught almost operatically. Now, I can do light opera. For instance, uh, Phantom of the Opera, I can do that. Right, uh, right. And I can do, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the, some of the Broadway shows, like Showboat, Howard Keel. 
He was an operatic singer. I can do stuff like that. Wow. Make you think I sing opera, but I really don't. But um, that's I'm a singer first, and then I'm an impersonator. <laughs> All day long I biddy biddy bum. If I were a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work hard. Da ga di ga di ga di ga di ga di ga di ga dum. Lord, who made the lion and the lamb? You decree I should be what I am. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan? If I were a wealthy man. Hey, hey. So I tell you, I, I didn't know that you were a trained singer, but I could tell you, that you had the chops for sure when I was like, I'm like, wow, this guy. I mean, because you see other people do tributes or whatever. And, and, and you know, you know, like uh, what would they say? A uh, little pitchy dog. But <laughs> but when you sang it, it was awesome. Like I was like, wow, man, this this is really Thanks. impressive. Yeah. Thanks. When I was a baby, mama told me, son, always be a good boy. Never play with guns. But I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. You know, another thing, uh, I you know, as you're talking, I'm, things are popping into my head. Another thing I did, I did a, uh, the last two days I was up in the Poconos and I had, it's called uh, Give My Regards to Broadway. Everything I did was Broadway. And I would try to, and I didn't have an opportunity to go change into costume, but what I would do is I would put maybe a hat or like for Phantom, while the music is playing in the beginning, I'm putting on the cape and a mask and a hat and I come out. And what I do is I don't just stand there and sing with the outfit on. I act it out like you're seeing the actual right. Phantom of the Opera singing this song. Close your eyes and let me set you free. Only then can you belong. Or Tevia. I'll put a fake beard on with the thing and the prayer shawl. And I come out and I sing it like Tevia. I don't sing it like John. I sing it like Tevia would sing it in the show. Right. Love that. Yeah. That's saying, that's almost saying, oh, look, he's doing an impersonation of right. that character. When in reality, this is John's interpretation of this particular scene in the show that I'm targeting so so you I, it's almost like you know you can add that to those three things like impression impersonation uh, i don't know what word i'd use but that's in there too that's kind of cool i just thought of that yeah yeah that's oh. uh, there there's so many different dynamics and levels to to what you do to kind of get get it out there and and you know and like you said there's there's parts of it where, where people completely whether they're just discovering these characters or just discovering you know these broadway musicals yeah yes i think you're in a way you're bringing to light so much stuff through th these tributes and impressions and impersonations and all of yeah. them you know don music is uh music is so important i'm sure you know and you may have heard it before i mean music is really um it's magical and i say that because you know you have people who are unresponsive almost comatose and you sing to them and their lips start moving for the words and their heads turn and their eyes open music can reach anyone anywhere that's what i love about it i do a lot of senior facilities because of that because i know the importance of music in people's lives and you know it's not big money or anything but it's just it's almost like my contribution to helping them later in life because i know look i'm getting there right. <laughs> I, love, I hope there's opportunity for people to come and sing for me my gosh i tell you um 
it is very rewarding uh, in in a sense of your soul when you do those types of things and, and you give back to these people who, and, and I think that, you know, our, our older folks there, you know, they, they, uh, they need, need that and they need, they need more um, respect from us in a way. I think sometimes yeah. they, they, especially in the nursing homes, I worked in a nursing home for like three years mm -hmm. back in the day as a janitor when I was younger. And you, you see the highs and lows of, of, um, of what they go through. Yeah. And I think when people like you, the entertainers who come in there and you, you brighten up their day and, and you, you make their week and like you, it does make a huge difference. Yeah. So, and, so kudos to you for doing that. That's oh, awesome. Thanks. And it, you know, I, the first show I did two shows. I told you just a couple of days ago after the first show, this woman comes up to me and she says, and she was a friend of mine. She told me she was coming with a group. And she said, do you remember the first time that we met at one of the, I said, I, and I, I said, I think it was Elvis. She said, it was Elvis. She says, but you don't know what happened prior to me coming there. I says, no, I don't. She said, my husband just passed away about a month ago. I was just diagnosed with a, a disease that scared her to death. She didn't know what to do. And her friends were trying, and she said, I was so despondent. She said, I was so depressed. I was on special medication. She said, my friends were trying to lift my spirits and get me up. She said, look, let's go. Let's go see this Elvis. Just, just go. It'll help you. So against her will, she went to come to the show. I didn't know this. In my show, I'm very, I'm very hands on. I love to interact with my audience. I love to sing among the people so right. I can touch them and talk to them. And this day, I picked her, put her in a chair, and I sang Can't Help Falling in Love to her. And I gave her a lay. She says, you have no idea what that did for me. No, I didn't know that, Don. I'm just doing what I do, you know. Right, and right. But it's exactly what you said. You know, these people, you don't know how you affect someone by the things that you do, whether you're a singer or not. You know, you can hold the door for somebody, help someone across the street, you know. But it's so important to just be the goodness that you should be so that you can share that with the world and make people have a better existence. True indeed, man. That story gave me the, the goosebumps. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's that that kind of stuff that makes it all worth it and that's the priceless stuff they can't put you you can't put a, a price tag on that like yeah. you, you know what i mean and and to affect somebody in a positive way doing something that, that you love and uh it, it just doesn't get any better than that uh, that's to me that's i agree that's what that's what makes life beautiful man yeah, i agree yeah and you need to do that kind of stuff because you know what if you don't it's almost like it's a waste of time i mean Really, you you want you look. I know I want to be treated like I treat other people. I expect that, and right. I don't think it's too much to ask. Look, we were put on this earth to do God's will, and that's I believe that's God's will. And and it's it's funny how we all are able to in our own way to to do that to transcend that through mm -hmm. our talents you know and and uh, you know uh, being uh, you know doing all these these tributes and impersonations and impressions and all that stuff just it it just takes people sometimes it could take people it, it, of all ages into a different headspace because yeah. they they transport back there so they're watching like you do Elvis they oof, they're there. Or, you know, and so I, th I think that that's super cool. Um, you know, it's funny you're talking about, what I, you know, a lot of this conversation, we're gearing it toward the seniors. I I had to do Elvis for a six-year-old girl's birthday. <laughs> All six-year-old girls. I, I, it was a friend of mine, he, a Johnny Cash impersonator, who asked me if I would do it, and I said... I said, oh man. I said, oh, he said, come on. She loves it. You'll love it. It'll be great. 
So I agreed to do it. <laughs> That's awesome. I never done it. I never did a show for little kids. Right. Well, this little girl, she had an inflatable guitar. She gave one to each one of her friends. Don, she knew every word to every song I was singing. Wow. And I was so impressed because she even knew I had to learn a song for this little girl. And I didn't even know the song. <laughs> that was her favorite Elvis song. And it was one I didn't know. Wow. Yeah. So, so she goes you know, in the deep in the B, in the B sides. <laughs> yeah, you know, when earlier we talked about growing up with stuff and, and having it in your face and you love it because it's there. That's what happened with this kid. This right. kid just heard Elvis and she went off the deep end. She loved it. So it was probably one of the best shows I ever did because I couldn't do a bad song or anything, you know? <laughs> That's so great. That's so awesome, man. I I, I hope you have uh, some pictures, a video of that. I would love to, to see that. You, you rock it out and, and rocking the, the and that little girl with the guitar. That'd be awesome, man. And it's in their home, you know, sitting in the living room, all the kids <laughs> on the floor and just one of those things. That's cool. It's a good story. Yes, indeed. That's awesome, man. What would you say like um is your strongest uh impression or tribute that you do? What, what what's the one you look forward to the most? Well, the, well there's there's a few of them and for different reasons. Um uh, El Elvis, although there's a lot going on with Elvis. And by that, I mean, you know, I have to wear headgear and the suits that I buy and wear and maintain and yeah. carry around. And uh, everybody loves Elvis. I could yeah. probably, if I was able to, I could probably do Elvis until I'm, I die. Okay. Right, right. You know, I'm going to be 70 next, this June. Wow. And I'm still doing a 35 year old Elvis. And you look frankly, great. I don't know how the hell I pull it off, but thank you, Jesus. I'm still pulling it off. Yeah. And there's there's Sinatra, and I love doing Sinatra because it gives me the opportunity to sing and show off my voice. Yes, there's all such a hungry yearning burning inside of me. Right, yeah. And then there's Rocky because I don't have to wear anything that's uncomfortable. I can walk around and act stupid and tell my jokes and people love it. I get, I'd say, equal reaction to Rocky and Elvis. And right, then yeah. there's, there's characters like The Godfather, where I, oh, and I love, uh, I could say anything I want and people kiss my ring, you know. <laughs> and there's, all I'm doing is wearing a tux with that. I don't have to do anything. So there's varying levels of popularity with the characters that I do and reasons for it. But if I had to say there's one, I don't know if there is one. Right. But I really do enjoy doing all of them, really. When you jump into like um from one to the other. So if you're, you know, going from Rocky to Elvis, right. What's the that transition like in your head like is it easy to do is it just like oh like changing your clothes or is it a whole mind thing like you have to really kind of get into the mindset easy i mean now it is i've been doing it for years um you know, i'm not real quick story there's a female impersonator who's no longer with us and she was being interviewed by the newspaper and she they asked her the same question you just asked me and she says oh i I have to stop and allow that character to come into my body. And it takes a little while, but I become that. And that's not the way it is for me. I, I've been doing it so long that, uh, you know, I just distort my face and do it. I can, yo, and I'm there, you know, I could do it in a second. Same thing with Elvis. I want to thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I just want to say uh, I appreciate, you know, that shark scares me, man. I'll get rid of that shark, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, it, and it sounds cocky, and I don't want to sound cocky, but I've been doing it for so long, Don, that it's kind of easy for me to, to go from one to the other. 
Right. And that helps in my, I mean, it's really helps in my one man show when I do these characters one right after the other. Right. You don't have time to kind of yeah, go through a process. Little, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's little, I mean, he just went bang. He's right there. But yeah. Rich oh. Little just grabbed wig, put it on, do it. it man. Yeah. He was amazing. He was, he's, he was the best man. Like, uh, you know, he's still doing it. I think, right. He's still around. He's still doing it. <laughs> I think he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you look like, like, so Rich Little was definitely to me, the guide who, who started it all to what we mm -hmm. do to like how it is today. Right. He set mm -hmm. the standard and now, you know, we got through the, the Fred Travelinas, the Frank Caliendos and, and all of those. And now there's like this new, I don't know if you've ever seen this new guy, uh, Matt Friend. He's no. been out. There's this younger guy now. I think he's in his 20s, and he's been going around. He's been uh, just doing all these characters. Um, I just want to see what what's your thoughts on the new generation of that are doing this and kind of following the you know what you guys the, the road you guys paved. Well, I, I've never seen any anyone um, other than the people we've talked about. Quite frankly, I don't have a lot of spare time to be sitting in front of a television. When I do, <laughs> I'm not, I usually fall asleep in five minutes. And I <laughs> don't know part, but um, I haven't really seen anyone in the younger generation. Now that you mentioned it, what's his name again? Matt Friend is his Dad, name. Write down Matt Friend for me, please. I'm going to look him up. He did the, uh, he was at uh, the Oscars. He did like, he went to the, through the crowd and, did impressions of uh, some of the uh you know yeah. what characters he was doing he does uh what's his name jeff goldblum i think uh, from oh, okay. uh in in those kind of characters he does uh tom hanks and uh, uh and he does uh a different generation of characters yeah too. different generation of characters too very impressed with you so it makes me self-conscious about myself well also i just have to say what you managed to accomplish <laughs> Is is you didn't do an impression of Elvis? I'm doing an impression of Austin Butler as Elvis. You did the man, the husband, the son. That's very you good. Crushed that thing. I'm so impressed with you. You too. Right. Yeah. Right. So he's no, he's I've like. I would love to see that. Um, I, could, I really that I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm gonna look him up. Yeah. Try get off with you and check it out and who knows i might be able to do some of the younger people but i've never honestly i've never when i when i go to expand my repertoire i expand it in an area where i know i'm usually pretty like johnny cash right like right. i'll do and i didn't know i could do johnny cash a friend of mine who has a band about 10 years ago he says man your voice he said you sound just like johnny cash i said i get out of here forget and I blew it off. Yeah, almost like your natural voice sounds like Johnny Cash. Yeah. <laughs> Next like... thing you know, he, he gives me a CD of Johnny Cash. He said, just listen to him. I listen to him. Now, I do a Johnny Cash show. Johnny Cash and Neil Diamond. <laughs> That's awesome. And so I have to expand if the time, you know, if I have the time, to expand in areas where it's kind of easy for me to, to do it. And where I can hear it. If I can't hear it, I can't do it. Right, right, right. And the people you mentioned, like the the Tom Hankses and the uh, whoever else, like I can't even hear his voice. When I hear him do it, I'll say, "Oh yeah," but right, I can't right. hear to replicate it. Right, gotcha. It's, it's not in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And once yep. you get it in there, then I you could do probably it. do it. All right, yeah, cool. I need to hear it. That's cool. So I think that'll keep me away from the, uh, you know, from the younger guys. Like, but every once in a while, like musically, I can sound like a lot of singers, like uh, Jim Morrison of The Doors, for instance. Yeah, he's old, but I can do Jim Morrison. Yeah, yeah. 